Um, for sort of business is public comment, and just uh, so you know, we will have a second session of public comment after the third budget budget presentation. So, if you want to comment on the budget and want to wait, you're you can count you count now. You can comment twice if you want to. Um, but I just just in case you wanted to react. A more general comment. Yeah. Hi, Tina. Hi, Tina. <laughs> So I'm Tina Muncy, and a few years ago, I was a principal of a small school. And so I appreciate the wonders of a small school and the problems of a small school. And I'm saying that as a frame of reference for what I'm going to say next. I noticed in your first budget presentation, you had a slide that I've seen several times during the course of budget presentations in the last few years. And on this slide, it showed that it costs almost $10,000 more per student per year to educate someone in the Roxbury schools. You could put all of the Roxbury students on a bus and bring them here and educate them, and it would cost you less. You could allow all of the Roxbury students to choose any school they wanted to go to and pay their tuition in the beginning, and it would cost you less. But that's not the most important thing. To me, the most important thing is, I don't believe that the Roxbury students are getting as good an education in Roxbury as they get in Montpelier. Now, I want to quickly say, I have to assume that you have the very best teachers in Roxbury. And I know because I've worked with teachers for years that they are working very hard. That's not the issue. The issue is the system. And you as a board have had a lot of discussion about equity over the last few years. And I feel like this is not equitable. And so, I'm here tonight to say, I wish in the next few months that on your agenda, you would put an item to discuss how you could educate everyone equitable in, your, in Montpelier Roxbury. How could we educate the students in Roxbury better? What would be the system? Was it one of the two I mentioned? Was it something I can't even think about? But how would you do that? Because I honestly believe we're not being equitable to all of our students. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any other public comment? Anyone online? No? All right. Hey, Jim, I have a, a letter. Oh, oh, Angela. Can I have a comment? This oh, is sure. Angela. Yeah, no. Hi. Hi. Great, thanks all. Sorry, I wasn't sure my timing, if this is okay to comment. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. Um, great, nice to see you all. Angela Shea, um, thanks for your leadership, dedication to the district. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the saying, show me your budget, and I'll show you your values. Um, and as you think about this year's budget, I just, I just ask you to think about the following questions. Um, how does our current budget reflect our community's values when it comes to neurodiverse learners? Does our district have a philosophy or strategy for ensuring equity for neurodiverse learners? And if asked, could you articulate what that strategy is? Does our district have educators who are certified or in dealing with specialists? And are you the parent of or have you spoken to a parent of a student who is a, who is a neurodiverse learner to better understand what their experience in this district has been like? I don't expect an answer to any of these tonight, but they're not rhetorical. Um, I think if you ask yourself these questions with some curiosity, as opposed to defensiveness, and we can reflect on what we learn you'd be in a better position to build a budget that reflects the needs and values of our community. Um, and in addition, I just wanna say that I have deep concerns about the way our district teaches reading and writing, especially as it relates to neurodiverse learners. Our district has a duty to adopt an evidence-based, direct, explicit literacy program instruction as opposed to our current whole language approach. And it would be hard not to talk about our current reading curriculum and equity in the same breath due to the issues of low income, LEP and BIPOC students who are at a greater risk of falling behind their peers in reading proficiency. 
This has a lasting and profound academic and social emotional consequence. One in five students have a, has a language-based learning disability. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have someone else again. Please introduce your name. And the font is too far away. Lisa Burns. Oh. Hey, Lisa. Hi. Um, I will probably speak again in the budget section. But just before we get started, I would like to um, request to the board. I've spoken to many people in the community who feel that your um, efforts at transparency have not been very successful with regards to budgeting um, particularly. And so one of my questions that I'd like to uh, see answered is if there is in fact a budget cap of any type for the, um, the track project. I, we're getting this done in record time from the time you voted to to uh, allocate enough money to get the project going in November. The plans are now to break ground in June and have it done inside of a year, faster than any other infra infrastructure project, uh, making your net zero efforts seem pitiful. Um, but you left the door wide open in November for add-ons and costs, and we haven't seen anything about the bid. So I would just like to know if there's a budget cap for how much our board is willing to put into our trap. Um, yeah, it's kind of a funny question. Um, and I'll, that's, that's it, and I'll uh, ask uh, some follow-ups during the budget part. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, anyone else? Jim, I have a letter from the community that I was asked to read out loud. Oh, great. Thanks. <coughs> um, to the taxpaying citizens of Montpelier and the MRPS school board, we of the UES Food Service feel compelled to highlight some of the conditions of our employment with the district in the hope that during this budgetary and communication review process, there might be some consideration for fair employment practices and a livable wage for its employees. It is important to know that all food service personnel throughout the district are not unionized. Therefore, we have no representation or voice in policy and administrative decisions. We have been told that our only option is to negotiate directly with the superintendent. We feel strongly that previous attempts of communication with the superintendent have been met with indifference, so we are here tonight to ask for your consideration given the following. Food service personnel for the district are at-will employees, which means in the state of Vermont, employers can terminate an employee at any time and for any reason or no reason at all. Therefore, we have absolutely no sense of job security. Even in times of severe staff shortages, we are not allowed to work more than 5.75 hours a day, otherwise the district would be obligated to offer us benefits. Therefore, we often have to work at an unsustainable pace in order to provide healthy, well-prepared meals for hundreds of children each day. According to the Vermont Department of Labor, the average wage for cooks, institutions, and cafeteria is $18.13 an hour. Our wage is below that by several dollars an hour. The rate of inflation for 2022 was 9.1%. We were given a 3% wage increase at the beginning of this school year. We are working parents, single parents, heads of households. We take the responsibility of safe and nutritious food for the children and staff of our school very seriously. We are always professional and exceedingly kind and considerate, and the children know that they are very cared for. We hope that as the district develops a budget for the coming year that this group of employees is no longer overlooked. We don't feel acknowledged or appreciated by the cost spent on buying all employees coffee mugs, keychains, t-shirts, etc. when we struggle to make ends meet for our families. Thank you for your time and service. We hope that the general principle of equity for all will be materialized. UES Food Service. Thanks. Any other comments? Um, will there be a printed copy of that somewhere? Let me. It, it's Lynn. Yes, hi, Lynn. Let I will check and see if the person who sent it to me is okay with me forwarding it on to the board. Thanks. Um, the next order of business is consent agenda. Um, I'll do a motion to approve the consent agenda. 
I move to approve the consent agenda. Do you have a second? Um, <coughs> I second, but can I ask about the Winooski agreement? Sure. I had a question about that too. No. Okay. Well, I'll second. I guess we'll second so the discussion. With removal. I don't think we have to remove. We can just discuss before we vote on it, right? Yes. I, I don't need to remove it. I don't know if you need to. No. Can I offer a friendly amendment? Because um, Anna sent us uh, if we want to authorize the pre qualification criteria for potential construction management, it should be an addition in the motion to approve the consent agenda. Um, she just sent this, yes, last night maybe. So it's construction management, management pre qualification selection criteria. So you're, you would I, add that? I'm asking if we can add that as an amendment to the motion. I accept that amendment. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Do <laughs> um, you want to talk about the Winooski agreement? Can, can you just remind us what it is, please? Well, it's funny about it. When you sent me Winooski agreement, I kept thinking, do we have kids in Winooski? Like, I know, I, that's it's the Winooski Valley. <laughs> So Sorry, the Winooski yes. Valley is the region <coughs> that Montpelier Roxbury is a part of. It's my superintendent's group. It's um, okay. okay. So within the Winooski Valley, there's an agreement for lottery students. So that we run a lottery each year for students who want to go to a different school within our region and students who want to come here. Okay. So we just have to have a, an agreement of what number we're allowing to go and what number we're allowing to come in. Um, so and the board has to approve that. Right. So this this is just that agreement, okay. which is a yearly thing. Can you tell me what's what high schools are in that? Yeah, in Winooski Valley. Yeah. So it's Spalding, us, Northfield, um, <coughs> White River Junction, uh, Harwood, Stowe. Just going through my superintendent friends. U thirty two, although we have an exchange with U thirty two as well. <laughs> No, Peoples isn't. Oh, yep, Peoples. Thank you. We just don't have any kids really going there. That's Morrisville, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So they would be part with Stowe. And and I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We can talk about it outside the meeting. But can you just tell us, like, what if a kid is interested in transferring, they put in an application mm -hmm. with who? Val. They'll here at the high school, mm -hmm. so they get on the list for the lottery. Mm -hmm. um, the lottery is held in the spring, and the families are notified late spring okay. around whether they get it or not. And, uh, and do we max out that number with um, eight students? Was it eight students? You know, I don't know. I'd have to ask Val. Okay. I don't know exactly where we are right now with it. Okay. And do we usually we take in as many mm -hmm. as we send out? Is it like an equal exchange? No, it's no, like it's eight, eight to forty. 40. <coughs> eight to forty. Okay, send no more than forty. Accept no more than eight. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And while we're in discussion, I had a question on the warrant. Um, what's what is the new school of Montpelier? The new school is a school for students with special needs. Got it. Um, and so we have a student there who's tuitioned. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. Any opposed? Excellent. Um, so board discussion and action. Um, we have. Um, to committee assignments, uh, appointing Lynn to negotiations and equity, uh, and Rhett to policy committee. Um, do I have a motion to make those two appointments? So moved. Do you have a second? I second. Uh, any discussion? One point of discussion is I just. Um, I would love for in March when we're Reorganizing. thinking about what which committees and which roles that we all want to play, um, maybe for us to sort of put slightly more thought into into that process. We had talked about each committee chair writing sort of like an overview of what the committee is doing, um, what the work plan is, maybe the frequency of meetings, and to have all of that information available, especially to our newer members. Um, 
but so that we can all sort of like balance our time commitment and then maybe balance committees too based on what people bring to the table. We had talked about in policy that Jim brings this like legal mind to the table, which is very helpful. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I think we might just want to be <coughs> intentional in general about like how the committees work, what they're doing. Time commitment. Time commitment, because I think time commitment is getting a bit much. Yeah, um, agreed. And yeah, and, and then I think if we maybe come in with, with ideas of what the committees do, I wonder if there's even possibility for consolidation of some committees or at least a mm -hmm. little more intentionality about yeah, these committees need to meet regularly, these committees can meet, I mean, like finance is an easy one for meeting quarterly, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. It's, I think there's a lot of board members who are doing more like six or seven meetings a month instead of two, and that's, that's heavy, and that also goes to recruitment too, it just becomes harder and harder to get people to pull mm -hmm. that amount of time in. Um, all right, excellent. Um, all those in favor? Any, well, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Great. Um, congratulations to the new committee members. <laughs> and thank uh, you. Thank uh, you, Lynn. And thank you. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Brett. Uh, and now the, uh, our third uh, budget public forum. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind that for the board, You've seen a lot of this presentation prior. Just making sure I get this up. Um, and this is the longer presentation that the board saw the first go around um, with a few, a couple additions in there. So um, there have been some changes which Christina and I will talk through. Here's the outline of the presentation today and what we're going to move through. I'll go through some of this kind of fast because enrollment data you can just look at. Um, and it's just good to have in the back of your head. Um, and here are demographic information as well. Um, our themes, we want to continue to support our theory of growth, which I'll talk about in a, sen in a minute, while being sensitive to tax implications for our community. Uh, the state factors, we have an anticipated dollar yield that, of course, is uh, voted on by the legislature in May. Um, so it's still written as anticipated. We don't, and we don't believe that's going to change too much between now and May. Uh, the CLA and equalized pupils, we do know the CLA at this time, don't we? Yeah. So the CLA we know. Um, now and health and we have a good sense of equalized pupils we just forgot to change that part this might not be is this not the right one? one? Oh, 12 7 yeah. it's not 12 7 <laughs> sorry let's look at the right one okay. that's my fault Christina's like no I changed that slide <laughs> it's totally my fault let me pull up the correct let's try that again all right so our demographics haven't changed between <laughs> now and December Okay, so equalized pupils, we have a number. It's still likely to change a little bit. Um, our health rates are increasing 12.6% across the board. The school board has no say in that number that's given to us. And our insurance is increasing by $296,038. That's insurance through Visbit, um, not our health insurance necessarily. Oh, wait, no, is that the health insurance number? The it's Visbit. The yeah. yeah, the Visbit is increasing by 5.5%. So the 12.6% is represented in the $296,000 number. That's what the equivalent is. The local factors are we still we have decreasing enrollment in our Montpelier schools. Enrollment is relatively steady in the Roxbury Village School. Um, and we have contract negotiations going on with two of our unions. The mm -hmm. MREA is our faculty or teachers, and our MRESSA is the instructional assistance. Those negotiations are ongoing right now. Quick reminder to the board and the community, this is from Michael Fullen's work. Michael Fullen is a educational researcher out of uh, Canada who is highly respected in education. The right drivers for growth are capacity building, collaborative work, working on pedagogy and systemness, which I think is a word he may have made up. And the wrong drivers are accountability with no meaning behind it, focusing on individual teachers or individual leaders and their quality, 
focusing solely on technology for technology's sake, sake and fragmented strategies over time, the strategies that don't connect to each other. So it's just a reminder of um, what are the right and wrong drivers when we're thinking about our theory of growth and continuous improvement. Our continuous improvement goals for the years 2022 to 2024 we, we will decrease the percentage of chronically absent students. Um, when we made this goal, it was 32.3%. We are still around 32.3% because of the flu and COVID and RSV that hit our schools pretty hard in the end of November and throughout December, particularly at Union Elementary School and Main Street Middle School. Um, in order to meet this goal, though, our community li liaison was added in fiscal year 22, Nick Connor, he's amazing. We have five full-time social workers. We're suggesting a partnership with AmeriCorps that would work through Nick's office. They would provide mentoring and additional student to community connections. I believe the cost of, of partnering with AmeriCorps is around $12,000. It's not a huge budget item, but it could give us a big bang for a little bit of book. Uh, we've transitioned the truancy model from one of punishment to one of curiosity and relationship. Nick, of course, by law, still needs to send truancy letters. However, those letters are now, are now um, preceded by a smiling phone call from Nick of, and, and talking to what's going on and, and trying to get an understanding of how the district can better support a family whose child is not coming to school. We have data dash dashboards to better understand absenteeism, um, which is great. We can see when kids are absent, who, what types of kids are more absent, what days of the week they're more absent. Um, it's really fascinating data. Wednesday and Thursday are big absentee days for Montpelier High School, for instance. We would have never guessed Wednesday and Thursday as the days, but that's where we see the biggest absenteeism for Montpelier High School. You know, little things like that is popping up that are that's really fascinating. Um, and we're looking to reallocate an instructional assistant position here at MHS towards attendance, um, class skipping through accountability and building relationships. We've not been able to hire that person as of yet. Um, and then the other side of our continuous improvement plan, decreasing the number of students needing tier three support. So this is remedia remediation um, on universal skills. And the most layman way to put that is that if a child is reading, writing, or doing math around two years below, have skills two years below their grade level. Um, it doesn't always come out to that way, but that's the most layman's way of putting it. Um, then they would might qualify for remediation in tier three um, to no more than five percent five percent is not just a made-up number that's what um, research shows it should be around um, through significant research with response to intervention done several years ago so in order to do that we have focus on intentional student engagement and first instruction we needed to clearly define the tiers of instruction um, which we've now done we needed to prioritize standards and the universal skills and proficiency indicators for each of those things. We needed to provide a fully staffed um, faculty that have expertise in remedial instruction. We're working on that still. We're very close to it. We've added some positions to help this. We've moved that team um, to under Mike Berry, the Director of Curriculum and Technology, so that we can ensure that they're not getting different messages from different leaders. Um, and Mike has been able to move their work much faster this school year. Um, we added the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Wellness in FY23. Jeff Murray is, is just doing fabulously in her job. Uh, we are looking to add two full-time social emotional learning interventionists, one for Union Elementary School and one for Main Street Ele Elementary School. We have actually put those positions into our IDEAB uh, grant for this school year. That's, of course, our grant that we receive for special mm -hmm. education. Um, because these people, the intent of these positions would be to provide SEL services and skills that are written on IEPs, which we are, have a growing need for. Um, we have yet to be able to hire those positions. Of course, we added a mid-school year, so um, it's not surprising. Uh, but that is part of next year's budget as well, coming out of the revenue source of IDEAB. And we're looking to add Panorama, which is a data warehouse, and that's suggested for fiscal year 24, so we have yet another place to pull data from quickly and accurately. Uh, this is our theory of growth. The board has seen this slide many times now. 
we have a theory that if we have uh, these four what we call pillars um, moving efficiently and effectively, then we would be building limitless futures for every one of our learners. And the four pillars are collective responsibility and collaborative practices, a formalized essential learning, timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, and high quality instruction in every classroom. There's a little write-up underneath this to go into more detail as to what each of those pillars are. And in terms of those four pillars for budget or financial, um, and of course financial is both dollars spent as well as time spent, since we're spending people, paying people for their time. Under collective responsibility and collaborative practices, we're redistributing staffing for student information and data systems. We had a resignation in the central office staff, um, and we're redistributing that to help Mike Berry's office out a little bit more. Our guiding coalitions are teacher leadership teams that work with the administration in each building to guide this work forward. And our professional learning communities, our teachers are all in professional learning communities so that they can collaborate because this work is too hard to do individually. Under professional development, we have continued coaching in professional learning communities to our principals so that they can further support the teaching teams. Um, we have assessments and goal settings, effective action and accountability that hasn't pre previously occurred. And then for leadership, coaching instructional leaders to lead that PLC team growth. They've done some work with Solution Tree so far this year and are continuing that work. Under formalized essential learning, we have designated teacher leadership on all of our curriculum teams that work directly with Mike Berry. Uh, under literacy, we have a focus on word study and writing this year, writing instruction. Uh, in math, our teachers, we work with teachers development group at MHS and MSMS, that's um, more adolescent math, developing math patterns of thinking and ways of thinking. Um, and then we're working with Christian Cordemanche and differentiated math practices at UES and RBS as well as with our fifth grade team at MSMS. And then ensuring collective, uh, collective understanding of our priority standards and proficiency scales. We've done some considerable work on that, and families will begin to see a change in reporting um, in the next few months through our prioritization work. Under timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate, uh, on staffing, we're adding those social-emotional interventionists at MSMS and UES. We're suggesting the board add a school counselor at MSMS, bringing us from one FTE to two full-time employees at MSMS, MSMS and counseling services. And we're suggesting to add a district psychologist um, full FTE there. Under professional development, targeted remediation in tier three, we want to continue to increase the capacity of our intervention faculty through professional learning, through time spent together uh, using case studies and such to, to develop their capacity there. And then an increased focus on first instruction in tier two intervention work, which is goes through the PLCs and the leadership team is also working to, to think how can we do this um, in a non-fragmented way moving forward next year for our professional development that's still in the works. Under leadership, we, we ensure that schedules offer time for intervention, remediation, and enrichment. We have that going pretty well in three of our buildings. It's a little trickier here at Montpelier High School just because high schools are a little bit different beast in terms of scheduling. Um, and that's still a challenge that we're working on and then have collective learning regarding effective goal setting and universal skills. We're still creating goals that are too big to accomplish for our kids. Um, so we, we need to continue to bring that down um, so kids can build confidence through quick wins mm -hmm. with their goals. In t terms of high quality instruction in every classroom, we're not adding any new staffing in regards to high quality instruction this current, this next year. Our teach, we do have two coaches who function in our district, um, Amy Kimball in math and Laurel in reading and writing. Um, they do coaching cycles with our teachers, but the, those positions have already been added, so that's not a new position. In terms of professional development, like I said, in literacy, we are focusing in on word study and writing this year and next. Math with our TDG work and Kristen Cordemanche work. We're still working with Up for Learning and John Kitta around our sort of practices. Um, and working at the leadership level with engagement strategies. And what do we mean when we say what are effective engagement strategies for instruction? And uh, leadership, we work uh, at least once a month as a leadership team to coach instructional leaders to lead pedagogical change in our district. 
All right, Christina, you get the good stuff. There we go. Good evening. Happy New Year. Um, so the glossary of terms that you're going to hear me use over and over over the next few slides um, is the general fund, which is the main operating fund of the school district. Uh, the capital plan, which is the long-term fund for planned facility needs, um, and that's warned as a separate article on your ballot. The education spending, which is the total budget less any local revenues, such as federal and state grants, um, tuition, and interest. So that's really the amount of money that you have to raise um, through taxes. Equalized pupils, this is my favorite one. Um, this is how our students are weighted. We don't look at our students as, we don't do, just do a head count. That's not how the tax rate is derived from. It's based on equalized pupils. So your preschoolers are weighted at 0.46. Uh, secondary students are weighted at 1.13. We get an additional weight for poverty, poverty and English language learners. Um, and you all, have, you've heard that the weighting study is going to be changing um, in your next budget cycle, FY25. The property dollar yield, um, this is the estimated amount the district has to spend, would have to spend per pupil to have an equalized tax rate of a dollar while generating enough money for the state's ed fund. So if we have a good economy, we have a higher yield, which you'll see in this budget, um, we'll have lower tax rates. And the CLA. This is the appraised value of property versus the market value. Um, in this budget cycle, we do have the CLA that was announced just a couple weeks ago. Currently, the budget unknowns. Um, our equalized pupil count is likely to change. I just got an email today that they'll, they'll be changing that again. So by the time you vote on the budget, it'll, it'll be a different um, equalized pupil count. And the revenues, we're just waiting on the transportation aid. And under expenses, we're waiting on our career center six semester average and the contract negotiations. So we made an estimate based on um, prior years. So our budget at a glance, currently our total budget increase is 6.07. We still have an estimate on the revenues, waiting for uh, the transportation aid, and then the equalized pupils. Again, this is an estimate. We know this is likely to change. So the overall um, ed spending per equalized pupil increase is 8.95%. The enrollment projections, do you want me to touch on any of that? Or? Okay, let's go through. So for our staffing overview at the district level, we're suggesting to add a school psychologist, which is 1.0 FTE. This is actually a budget neutral ad um, because we've been contracting that service out so much that we would, we're would we gonna use the money that we've been contracting out and stop doing that, hopefully, and hire a person to do that, which will be much more efficient and effective for our district. Um, we've also moved the social emotional learning director it, we have been paying uh, that salary out of our ESSER. We're, we've moved that into the local budget. It's this position that we feel we need, we want to hold on to. We have the opportunity to put it in the local budget this year, so we've made that switch. At Union Elementary School, the social emotional learning interventionist that will be working with students with special needs who have social emotional learning skills written into their IEPs, which is, of course, an individual education program or plan, sorry. Uh, we're suggesting a reduction in force or a RIF for K-6 licensure. This is represented on the enrollment slides. Um, you can, the board can see how there is a bubble that's moved through Union Elementary School. It's moving into the middle, or it's in the middle school, in the beginning of high school, um, and Union Elementary School does not need as many K-6 um, or licensed teaching, general teach, general education teachers. The reason why it says K-6 is because that's where the licensure status is um, in our contract and the way licensing goes. At Main Street Middle School, we're suggesting adding a school counselor at 1.0 FTE. Union Elementary School and Montpelier High School both have two counselors. Main Street currently has one. Uh, we'd like to add another one based on the social emotional needs of our students. 
Uh, also adding a social emotional learning interventionist at Main Street Middle School to round out our uh, effective tiers of intervention. This is, like I said before, being a revenue source is being used to pay for both SEL interventionists. And then adding a literacy interventionist at MSMS for that uh, tiered system of support and our pillars to support that pillar of learning. Currently, there is one 0.0 FTE literacy intervention at Main Street Middle School, and we'd like to have two. We have data to support that we need another. Okay, the education spending for people, um, we're gonna now look at what the total budget is in the following slides. Um, since, <clears throat> excuse me, since the last meeting, um, the only number on this page that changed was the an additional decrease to the equalized pupils that I had gotten just moments before our last meeting. <laughs> um, so there was an additional 17.74 equalized pupils that were decreased. This slide is the expenses by school. So this compares each building. <coughs> Excuse me. So the expenses by program. Our general education budget is up 6.14%. Um, this has to do with the health insurance premiums. And you're gonna hear that as a constant theme in each one of these lines is because the health insurance, we have staff in these sections. So you're gonna see that increase each, each program. Um, special education is up 4%. Uh, career center tuition, we're not anticipating much change there. The co-curriculars and athletics, that's up 11%. Um, that's incre increases to the wage schedule, transportation. We increased, uh, we made an increase to the Racial Justice Alliance. We added boys JV volleyball, a math club, and an affinity alliance. Under student support, which includes the nurse, um, guidance, social work, speech, that's up 11%. Again, that's because of health insurance premiums and contract negotiations. Staff support, which includes the library, curriculum, professional development, that's up 8%. Um, and the main increase here is we consolidated all the copier contracts and all the cell phone contracts into one area so it would go under the tech budget. Otherwise, we were allocating it to each department or each function and program. Let's see, the school board and superintendent, that is up 4%, so we had an increase in our audit expenses. The principal offices and special services and admin, that's up 7%, um, an increase due to health insurance premiums. The business services, uh, there's an increase about 4%, that's an increase in health insurance. In building, buildings and grounds, um, that's up 4%, that's increases in heating and electricity costs. We're seeing about $60,000 more just this current year, so next year we're anticipating a much higher increase. Um, safety, we're looking at doors and locks, so there's um, an increase there of 23%. Under transportation, there's a slight decrease based on the actuals that we're spending on transportation right now. Our debt service and fund transfers, there's a small increase um, in our principal and interest payments, but that's it. So overall, it's a 6.07% increase on expenses. The next couple of slides just demonstrate different ways of looking at the budget. Um, you can see how, where it stands in the overall budget, general education versus special education. And then the next slide is just a uh, comparison year to year. And this is another way to look at our expenses. This is by category. So if you wanna just look at salaries and benefits and kind of separate those out, um, you can see that salaries are up 5.5%. This reflects the actual staffing that we have and the open positions that we budget for. Health insurance, you can see that reflects, it reflects the actual coverage on single versus family, you know, the different plans that our employees are participating in. Professional services, um, that's up 8%. This current year, um, we have a huge increase in 504 requirements, so we are planning on um, maintaining those contracts for next year, so we are seeing a large increase there. Purchase services is up just a 2% increase. Um, those are building base, um, well, I should say increases now. We did go back to the drawing board on that one when we first went into the, um, on our second budget presentation. So we did go back to the board, uh, the building administrators and let them add some things back in. The contracted service is up 1%, normal year to year increases for our contracts. Tuition, um, 
a small increase just due to district out of district placement. Um, supplies and technology and books. Uh, we're anticipating a 5% increase there. The network increases are offset by E-rate e -rate revenue. So this is federal funding. Um, so you'll see a revenue source that will offset this increase. Utilities, like I said, oil and electricity are up. So we're planning on, we're budgeting for that. Equipment, um, we did go back to the board, drawing board on that one. That should say increase, my mistake. Um, so we are increasing by 6% there. It's a $6,000 increase. Dues and fees, those are increases to our professional associations district-wide. Uh, principal and interest is up 1%. And then the fund transfer to food service, we're just maintaining the 110,000 that we did for the current year. The next two slides just show it as a pie chart and a year-to-year -year comparison. So the revenue side, um, we're still waiting on a couple numbers here, the six semester average for the tech on behalf. Um, the education spending grant at the top, so that's the balancer. That's what we have to raise in taxes and, and collect from the ed fund. Everything else is, is subtracted out of your total um, expenses to get to that balancing number. Uh, the small schools grant is going to remain level. State transportation aid, um, that's based on the FY22 actuals. The SPED block grant, this is new in, in this current year. It was a different funding mechanism last year. Um, so that's up 12%, which was nice to see. <laughs> um, the extraordinary cost, that's based on the service plan and any students that we anticipate being over $65,000 for out-of-district placements. Uh, let's see, the special ed triple E grant. That was, this is a new number from the last time I met with you. It's h higher than we were anticipating. I had been using 105,000 because that's what we received this current year, but it went up to 117,000. Um, we're not anticipating any state place reimbursement. The driver's ed reimbursement is usually right around $8,000, so we're not anticipating any change there. And the tech ed transportation, that doesn't, change much, so we're anticipating 14,000. IDAB, um, all of these, the next few lines, these are all our grants, so they match our expenses dollar for dollar. They're reimbursable grants, so when you spend the money, we ask for the money back, and, and that's how that works. Um, the only thing I would highlight is down at miscellaneous. This is where you're gonna see an increase in E-rate reimbursement. Mike Berry and I are working on making sure we maximize the reimbursement rate that we get from E-rate, and that's for all of our tech needs. The next slide is the capital plan, and there, um, there's no change here for fiscal year 24. So this is what you've seen in the last few presentations. <clears throat> And the tax rates. So this is, okay, this slide will show you your residential tax rate calculation. So you have your general budget um, and your non-tax revenues. Again, the equalized pupils are likely to change. The property dollar yield is subject to change, um, usually set in May. It's shockingly high this year, <laughs> um, the last two years. It's been kind of unprecedented to go up $2,000 like it has been. Usually we'd see a couple hundred dollars. Um, but I, I don't see a reason that for that to change much. At least that's what they're telling me. <laughs> um, and so with the current assumptions, the tax rate would increase by 1.28% for Montpelier, so that's two cents, and decrease by 9.67 for Roxbury, so that's a decrease of 13 cents. The next slide, I like to point, I just brought this to you, I think, oh, is there one that says ballot language? Oh, sorry, I must have skipped it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so this slide is new. I added it the last time I met with you. And I think it's important just to highlight um, 
that the current language in the ballot, they changed it a few years ago. I can't remember wh what year they changed it. But it doesn't really clearly show the voters that this is a minimal tax increase for Montpelier and a tax decrease for Roxbury. The language doesn't show that right now. So I just want to highlight this and bring it to your attention as a, as a mechanism to talk to your voters, um, you know, just to explain what it means. So the, the current language reads, shall the voters of the Montpelier Roxbury Public School District approve the school directors to expend $28,580,118, which is the amount the school directors have determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It's estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $19,653 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 8.95% higher than the spending for the current year. So if you look at 8.95, that can be a scary number um, for um, taxpayers. But going back to the previous slide, just real quick, um, you know, it's a 1.28% increase on the tax rate for Montpelier, and it's a decrease in Roxbury. So I just wanted to give you that kind of um, information so you can share. The next slide. Um, so what does that mean on your property tax bill? Um, for a $100,000 house in Montpelier, that means your taxes are going to go up $22 with this proposed budget. For a $100,000 house in Roxbury, your tax bill is going to go down $139. So you can also see in there the $200,000 property value or $300,000 property value. And another note, um, there is about two-thirds of Vermont households pay their property taxes based on income. So that's the income sensitivity that you sometimes hear about. If they fill out um, their declaration of homestead during filing their taxes, uh, they sh could be awarded um, a direct payment to the town um, for their taxes. So their tax bill would be decreased. Oh, Jill's really good at this. If you want to put in it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the next slide shows the residential tax rate history. So this just demonstrates with the CLA and without the CLA and how important that number is. If, we, if the CLAs in, uh, oh gosh, in Montpelier and Roxbury hadn't changed or if we, if we don't have to include the CLAs, you know, your tax rate would be $1.27. But because of the CLA, it goes up to $1.69 for Montpelier and $1.30 for Roxbury, well, decreases for Roxbury. The next slide is the non-residential tax rate. So these are um, for second homes, vacation homes, that type of thing. And that's the end of my presentation. There's any questions? And this is available on our website for folks at home. Um, questions? Just had a couple of quick ones. Yeah. Um, the, the waiting study change that we're anticipating next year, where it shows up is in those, the equalized pupil count that you're still getting changing numbers, is that right? So next year at this time, that will be showing up? Yes. Okay. And I'm afraid that it's not going to be good news for Montpelier at Roxbury. Right. But. Well, they have issued, a, or they've given us a calculator that we can start looking at the numbers. So um, in my next financial reports, I might be able to kind of give you some more information on that. Okay. And the idea is that, like, our equalized pupils will be adjusted by a different weight for poverty and ELL and things like that, that it's not right now. Correct. It's, okay. Yeah. Um, and then this other question, it might be for Libby or it might end up being rhetorical. So. For the UES, um, the RIF, are we anticipating a vacancy? Do we have, like, I'm just wondering if we have someone employed that is, like, if, is, I mean, does that mean effectively that we're losing a staff member at UES? Yes. Okay. However, the way our contract is written is that a RIF can be accomplished through a resignation okay. within our K-6 licensure area. Okay. So if a high school science teacher re resigns, that doesn't help us. But if it, there's a resignation within the K-6 licensure, then that accomplishes that RIF. Okay. And that's how it generally has happened in the past. Like, okay. You know, you can't promise it, but right. typically there is some turnover in our K-6 faculty. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I have.
It does, and, and you said UES specifically, it's in the K6 licensure. So that includes RBS, oh, right. UES, and, and Main Street Middle School yeah. with our fifth and sixth grade teachers. And then following up on that, the on the new waiting study, have we yet gotten word on how that's going to be implemented? Because I know it's going to have um, deleterious tax implications for the district. But is do we know? Is it going to hit us all at once? Are they going to phase it in? Is that a, my understanding? It's a five-year phase-in plan. Yeah. Okay. Have you heard that number too? Yeah, yeah. five years and. <clears throat> and and relatedly, I noticed that I mean there is kind of going to the our student projections. Um, yeah, they were going down. Um, and then I see like the twenty five twenty six kindergarten class seems to be a little more in line with historical numbers. So, are we confident? that they're going down long term or did we just have a couple of years where people decided to kind of take a break from having kids? <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that's based on birth rates. <laughs> yes. So it's really impossible to tell, yeah. you know, like it, it's impossible. We couldn't predict who's going to sell their home in Montpelier, what yeah. family's going to move into yeah. that home in Montpelier. Um, so it, I think it's impossible to predict. So it might be a little too early to tell if we have a long term yeah. trend going. Yeah, yeah. Okay. like Libby said, that's based on birth records. So that's the only thing we have to yeah. make any projections. Okay. Um. Looks like Merrick has his hand, and I have a follow up question on the yeah. equalized Merrick? people. Yes. Yeah, I also have a follow up on the equalized people. I was just wondering, like, what are the likely effects of potential bad news for Montpelier when it comes to the, the waiting study or equalized? I want to be careful as phrasing it as bad news oh, yeah. because it is good for Vermont to change the waiting study yes. to make sure that we have an equitable funding system right. across our state. Um, what the impact is is that Montpelier Roxbury will have to significantly increase our tax burden in yeah. order to level our budgets is what it looks like. Yeah. And is there any initial ideas about how significant that will be? We don't know. Not yet. They've given us a couple models, but they're models right now. So we don't have a definitive. And then there's a five year phase. It, it, it is unlikely to be insignificant. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to phrase yes. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Christina, you said that the equalized people number that we're looking at right now, which is 1,220.1, right? You said that's likely to change again. Is that right? Or is this the new one? Yeah. Um, this is new since the last time I met with you. Right. Um, and it is likely to change just um, not as significantly as this last change. Right. Some schools are still um, submitting their numbers. So okay. it's a statewide kind of equalization. Um, so we have to wait for that to come out. There's usually three or four uh, iterations. Iterations, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And it's likely to keep going down in our case, or would it? Is it possible that it would go up a bit? I I wouldn't be able to. Speak no to idea. That. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. We have a question on the board. Is it uh, uh, I might be the only one on the board. That doesn't know the answer to this, but. Um, we had public comment, so I figured I'd bring it up right now. Uh, can you speak to the the reasons why the uh, cost per pupil at RVS is 10,000 higher than UES? Is that an easy answer, or is that a whole separate meeting? I think there's several <coughs> reasons. Um, there's there's simply less people there, and we still have services that need to be provided. Um, so it's like the most basic right. answer, right? right. So. Um, whereas a special educator at Union Elementary School has a caseload of 12 students with an individual education plan, our part-time edu special educator currently has a caseload of two. But we still need to provide services to students with special education, right? So, so it's like an economy of scale. It's, it's, it's totally an economy of scale piece. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question that might have a future answer, um, not yet known, and it's a little bit granular and kind of programmatic in nature, but um, I'm just thinking about like the, the various different SEL connected positions that we're adding, and I'm wondering 
um, like are the psychologists, the social workers, school counselors, SEL interventionists like all gonna fall under the SEL director or are they like shared positions between SEL and SPED? And I'm just wondering about like from a management and efficiency perspective and like how it's ensured that kids are kind of accessing, you know, the services and getting the best outcomes. Like, I guess, how will those be managed? And that might be like a future question for Jess when we hear from her in the future, but. So any position that falls under social emotional learning, regardless of whether it services students with special needs or not, falls under Jess Murray. Mm -hmm. Any position that is just special education or general special education, like the psychologist, mm -hmm. will fall under Peggy Sue Van Ostrand, who's our director of student services. Mm -hmm. That's how we've divvied that up. Okay. They work extremely closely yeah. together. Yes. <laughs> so they're often sharing an office yep. um, with each other, and they're often online in meetings together currently so that they're, learn they're still learning each other because they're yeah. new to our district and they're new, just as a new position. Um, so they work incredibly closely and spend right. a lot of time together right now. That may ask, answers my question of how that benefits kids. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of connectivity between those. A huge yeah. amount, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. And the plus, we were just talking about this yesterday, on Monday morning in our, in our core team meeting, which is our central office leadership team meeting, mm -hmm. uh, the director of curriculum and instruction, director of student services, and director of SEL spend more time together mm -hmm. than they've ever, those positions have ever spent together. Mm -hmm. Previously, mm -hmm. um, before we were able to hire Peggy Sue and Jess, it was very siloed. Yeah, those departments were very siloed. Not anymore. Yeah, they're talking with one voice, and they spend a lot of time together. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, it's fun to see. Yeah. Emma. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with the budget. I think um, it's always a little frustrating. Like on slide 31 where you see our tax rate uh, without the CLE, CLA, sorry, year to year. And it's like a dollar um, 27, $1.27 next year projected, which is the lowest that it's been in all the years that are on the slide. And um, so it's just frustrating to me. I, I know that Rhett at, asked this at the last meeting because I watched the video, but the language on the ballot is there any way for us to add a sentence to the end of that language, or does it have to be exactly the way that you have it on the slide? Um, well, it's statutory, so I can't that. Decision. Uh, there is talk about going to the legislature and asking them to change the language because it just doesn't portray the true picture of your tax rates. I mean, I'm really grateful to live in a district that's super supportive of schools and tends to um, pass the school budget with a very wide margin. So I don't anticipate us having a problem, but just, you know, if I were in a different district or I, I'm not sure um, what the voting history is in Roxbury, but, you know, it's, I know that I've, I've worked for districts before where the school budget doesn't pass sometimes and this language isn't helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, so I have a few questions. I, I think they're pretty quick. Do you mind if I go through them? You can cut me off. Yeah, no, definitely. Just a note on that we are having... Public uh, comment. No, we are having members of our legislature or our reps to the State House come next week. That might be a uh, good point to bring up to them. And okay. Is, huh? <laughs> I know. That's actually a really good idea. Okay. Yeah. Great. That would be great. Thank you. Um, so... The, at the last meeting that I was in attendance, which was the first one in December, we had the admin team here and they were talking about some of the stuff that they were hoping, you know, if there was any wiggle room that they would add back in. And I saw it looked like BIPOC and RJA Alliance that there was some money put back in for that. Can you speak to what? They're mostly supplies. Okay. They're mostly supplies for different clubs and things like that. Were you able to include the stipend that they were looking for, for the staff person? Rachel. They, they, she has it. That's in the budget. So there okay. was some confusion there as to okay. what. Um, I think Jason brought that up. Yep. Um, here at the high school, there was some confusion as to why he brought that up because it was already budgeted. Okay. Um, so Just we a had misunderstanding. Yeah, it was a misunderstanding okay. as to what was and was not budgeted. And um, and Julie from MSMS had talked about uh, tech devices mm -hmm. for the seventh and eighth grade team. Were we able to? Put mm -hmm. any of that? So, so she was able to add thirty thousand extra dollars back into her budget, and most of that were supplies for clubs and STEAM, uh, which is Eli Rosenberg's new programming yeah. mm -hmm. um, at the middle school. 
And then um, also Jason had mentioned for Montpelier High School, the scoreboards and enclosed outside bench. I believe that's part of what he added. Christina's looking yeah. at it right now. Yeah. I believe that's part of what he added. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad I can circle back to these things and that you have the answers And right to there. be clear, we're spending more to fix our scoreboard than we are than it would be to, to replace it. Replace it. <laughs> so, okay. so our scoreboard in our gym is pretty broken. Um, and then I wanted to circle back to something that I had asked also at the, at the last meeting I was in attendance for, and that was that I'm on a listserv about for the Montpelier High School Boosters Club, mm -hmm. and there's been a bunch of requests that, come, that came through there that seemed like it would fit in a school budget and not necessarily like a little <coughs> too expensive for a Boosters Club to, um, to be funding. And uh, the three that I remember off the top of my head were jackets for the championship i think it was the soccer team or the track team but they were looking to buy jackets and somebody had mentioned that u32 puts that into the budget and then there was another request for travel expenses associated with the track team who had qualified to compete at the either the regional or new england state new england um so there were some travel expenses requested for that and then a big one was that the theater um program here at the high school they had requested some lighting upgrade so it was like conversion from old lighting to LED lighting and then a proper um, lighting board, control board that would be able to <laughs> work with those lights. And, um, and that's like around $10,000 and they have a, some sort of fundraising page for that and they've asked the boosters for that. But I'm wondering if there's any room to include those types of things. Maybe this isn't a discussion for tonight or this budget, but just like moving forward trying to anticipate yeah, those, those types are of things. things for principals to talk with their staff about so throughout the fall principals work with their staff to say hey tell me what you need like tell me what your budgets are and if the principals aren't asked those things I think part of the problem that's happening is that um, teachers are used to going to boosters yeah boosters or parent the the pie mm -hmm. group for some things um, and don't think to budget for it. Like, don't think about the budgetary process. Which why? The, why would they? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, that's not really their right. their primary responsibility. So they go for the easiest route mm -hmm. to access money right away, because um, it's not always easy to access money right away from a school district that is responsible to our taxpayers. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think that's part of what's happening okay. here. Um, and we also had new principals coming in this year who were learning our budgetary process. Budgeting is different in every school district, yeah. right? And so um, I think part of, I think it's those two things happening, that mm -hmm. teachers aren't telling principals what necessarily what they need. Principals have to make hard decisions. They have to prioritize things in order yeah. to get to the number that they need to get at. Um, and it's easier to get quicker money from an outside entity than it is to you know, go through the process. Mm -hmm. So I think there's several things happening. Yeah. Um, like I was, I've, I've seen Kiana, who's the theater yeah, the um, person, the fundraiser, and I, I too was like, why is she doing a Go? Like I had no idea okay. before the GoFundMe was even up. So I was like, why is she doing that? You know, I never heard a <laughs> request yeah. for that. And I went, I okay. never asked Jason about it because it slipped my mind, but that was my fr initial thought when I saw that on Friends of Montpelier. Yeah, so I mean, that one in particular, you know, the theater is so wonderful and it's doing so many great <coughs> things and they're looping the middle school in. And so for me, it tugged at my heartstrings, you know, as like, this seems like an easy, like low hanging fruit thing. If it's only $10,000, I mean, we have the fund balance money right now. The school board has that too, that we could take it from. But I wanted to bring it up as a point of discussion and then maybe propose that we hear from Kiana at a future meeting. And maybe it's not in the budget, but maybe it comes out of fund balance, but I just think it should be addressed at some point. Yeah, and also kind of along those lines, I mean, could there be kind of opportunities early for word to get out to you know people who might not think about the budget as a process to get small things funded like coaches etc to mm -hmm. you know just kind of an invite from principals like put all your stuff in like they, let they us do do that yeah. yeah they do do that the challenge is something like jackets yeah. for a state championship soccer team yeah. right you like no you don't <laughs> predict that right yeah <laughs> right you can't well, predict that can there be year. like a little you know fund for unanticipated expenses that are small that they could go to and then you're like hey we we, yeah, we won. We won states. We didn't expect to. Yeah. Yeah. Can we? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and typically when things come to us for that, that's what we use our yeah. fund balance for. Um, 
that's yeah. how we typically use it. But if it doesn't come to us, then we can't make yeah. that decision. We'd also, I'd also say that there are lots of small things that come to us, and small things do add up they over add, time. Yeah, and so true. we need to be cognizant of that as well. Um, and I think that's part of my job and the principal's job to, yeah. to put things through a lens of what's appropriate use of the funds and what's not. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think the more the more those are known, the more you can prioritize. So then it doesn't become um, a community question as to why we're not. Yeah. Either there a community question why we're not, or uh, there there are some savvy coaches at U thirty two who are very good at advocating, and I'm I'm sure they know exactly where where to go mm -hmm. for money and and there might be folks here who are a little more shy and then folks who might quickly learn that Possibly, you know yeah. hey if i if i talk to my principal at the beginning of the year and, and get my things mm -hmm. teed up my things will will get you know in there and then other people aren't thinking about it and they're either going out to boosters or going without um mm -hmm. so it, it might be a you know you don't want like the loudest voices to always right. get right always get what they need yeah um, so another question I had was the, the um, we had been we've been hearing a lot about literacy and I don't understand you know the different trainings that are available but we've heard Orton Gillingham mm -hmm. mentioned many times part of our ESSER listening sessions and stuff. Can you speak to that? Like how many people we have trained in our district? We or? have one full time time staff doing only Orton Gillingham right now, and we have three staff members who are trained in it. Yeah. And I just was it a few years ago we had zero. Right. Yeah. Well, last year we had zero. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, we had um, uh, <coughs> on slide thirty. Uh, I just think that that might need to be updated just to be to reflect the actual housing prices in Montpelier. Like there aren't very many, if any, houses that go for $100,000 anymore. So we might just want to sort of like bump that up to give a more realistic um, view of what people's houses are worth and what they're being taxed on. For every $100,000 of value, it goes up. Right, so people can do the math, yeah. but it right. says a house worth 100,000 and a house worth 200 and a house worth 300. And I think it might, you want to start at 200 and go to 400? Yeah, it might be a little outdated. Um, I mean, it's also based on assessed value and not what you can sell it for, right? Yeah. But it's where so. the CLA comes in, though. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Those are my questions. Great. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Brett? I have two. Is Panorama the behavior dashboard? It just, can have behavior data in it. It's not the same it's not, it's as what not we're using old. right now? No, it's not. Old. Right now we have a homegrown dashboard. Ah. Uh, and so this would replace that. And how is that, <coughs> is the, that being, is that, we, I think it was, it was our board retreat. Uh, beginning of November, we learned about that tool and how is that, has that been a progressively helpful tool our homegrown dashboard well, yeah I mean I yep. think there was some different use and yep. has all the usage of it been sort of normalized throughout mm -hmm. or sort of I wouldn't say it's normalized yet it's still primarily in the hands of Mike and Nick and um, central office staff uh, however I now can text Nick and say I need the chronic absenteeism percentage that is accurate for now and he'll have it to me in two minutes, whereas I, that's never been able to be accessed before. So through Panorama, I, my goal is to eliminate the, the middleman. I shouldn't have to ask somebody to get this data. I should just be able to go get it myself. Right, okay. right now with the homegrown pieces, um, Mike and Nick truly run that. Now I have access to it and I can see it. Um, it's, just a, it's just a little, it's, it's not slick. It's not user intuitive yet. Um, the other one is the other questions um, with the if I say yes the cost per pupil has gone up 8.95 percent but the taxes are going down by 13 cents in Roxbury and someone says how that doesn't make any sense why 
is it mostly the common level of appraisal? Is it that yeah. that specific thing plus one other? It's mostly the dollar yield the plus dollar the common yield. level of appraisal. The both of those one plus the other. I'm, I'm maybe, eyeing Jill to make sure I'll that make she's a agreeing big with me. Sign that will go in. I, well, I don't know if you can do that, but <laughs> you can make a sign in the voting space. Well, does our Ed spending include like federal money and other things too? I mean, that might yeah, account for some of it. No. Takes out all the grants, all the local revenues. Um, our Ed spending for people, it's the amount of money we have to raise through taxes and Ed fund. <clears throat> can I ask? Um, the cost per equalized pupil, 19,000 or something. Um, do we have any comparable numbers to other districts where we stand? That's a good question. I not. I didn't bring any. I I that number is available because I've looked at it before, yeah. and they have like every school district, and you can see it. And I, th back when I was like really paying attention, we were kind of like middle, middle no, high. high end of the pack. Yeah but not anywhere near the like top. Yeah, but we're also 10 no, yeah. or the bottom. <laughs> yeah, if I recall, I think they were in the 70th-ish percentile, 70, 75th. Yeah, it is available well, on um, the good. Agency of Education website. You can see the cost for people um, And we wouldn't know, would we know, like uh, ours is going up 9%. Would we know what other districts are going up how much? Um, anecdotally. anecdotally yeah. Sorry. And Anecdotally. I, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'd say we're pretty much where everybody else is right okay. now. Yeah. In both of our um, professional groups, we've heard the same numbers and actually okay. much higher. I was, when I was, I went to my monthly uh, meeting last month, I was going in shocked with a 9%, but that was on the low side to my colleagues. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, like, and boards look at this differently is what I'm learning this year, actually. I, I never really paid as much attention as I have this year for whatever reason. And some boards come in and, and superintendents and business managers don't do the whole equation like we do from the get-go with anticipated dollar yield, anticipated CLA. Be and I'm, I, I don't know why they make that decision, but they don't, right? So. Um, I think it's important for the board to know from the get-go what these impacts are on the budget. We can't ignore them. Um, and so there, other school boards just focus on percent of increase around equalized pupil, and that's it, really. They don't look at us. So I know in districts very close to us, the boards have said 6%, no more. And um, central office staff are now having to like think, who, how many rifts do, like that, that equals people, right? So with with just the natural increase because they were around 11%, so they have to like half what they spend. So it's just a different, boards look at it differently. Business managers put together reports differently. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty, anecdotally, that's pretty common across the, yeah, the state. I've worked, I've worked with school boards that say, we only want an increase of 6%, you know, or 5% on um, the expenses. You know, they'll limit you that way, so. Let me show the whole picture. Are we entering the budget forum part of the meeting? Unless we have further comments or questions. Public forum, is that a hand from Dave Delcor or is that a cursor on the screen? Can I just, that's, yeah. a, that's a hand. Yeah. Right. yeah. Sorry, Dave, I just wanted to ask what the process would be for just for this portion of the meeting, because I know usually with public comment, we, we hear, yeah. we don't respond. I just, like, what's, and then what's our purpose? Because I also know that there's not much change we would expect yeah. to make to the budget after this point. So we could be hearing some feedback that we might not be able to implement. Or So I, I just wanted to know kind of how should we manage this part of the meeting? Um, how do people want to manage it? Do we want to? Answer questions. Do do we want to do it like we usually do public comment? Do we want to give ourselves the opportunity to answer questions if there's questions that can be answered? It seems that yeah, yeah I would like to. If, yeah. if we have time, I mean, we can kind of maybe I don't know if people there's nobody in the room, so if people online maybe could. Um, click the raise hand function if you if you plan to give public comment then we could like gauge roughly how many people have questions but i think yeah nice. people who would like to make comment 
Um, could you, if you understand the raise hand function, could you please do it? Uh, it's I think under. It's, it's under reactions, I believe. Yep. Yeah, if you go to reactions, so it looks like we have two, three. I mean, if there are questions that are appropriate to answer, we are happy to answer them. Um, <coughs> Uh, and we may state that the question is not appropriate to answer to. So, um, looks like uh, looks like David, Lisa, and Nathan in that order. And if you want to, if people want to pop in after that, just go ahead and, and hit the raise hand function. But uh, yeah, my name is just a quick question um, on the expenses by category slide. Uh, and and the just took sorry to interrupt. Please introduce yourself quickly, even though we can I'm see sorry, your David, name. Don't worry, yeah, thank service. you. Um, uh, on the expenses by category slide, it showed the budget total at $28,850,118. Um, and the draft ballot article is exactly $270,000 less than that. And, you know, it's 580000 instead of eight hundred and fifty. So it's either transposed or there's a, some reason that I'm not getting that the two numbers are different. And I just want to know which one's the right number. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. um, David, that the twenty-eight million five eighty does not include the capital plan, so you, we have to add in the capital plan, which is two hundred and seventy thousand. So the total budget is twenty-eight million eight hundred and fifty. Perfect. Thank you. And that's because the capital plan is a separate item, right, on the ballot. Thank, thank you. Yeah. So that's a separate article on the ballot. Article. Only the eagle eyes of a reporter would catch that, <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa. And again, yeah. please introduce um, yourself. So, uh -oh. pardon me. Uh, so, pardon me. I. So, please introduce yourself again for the. Can you hear me? We can now. Um, yeah, my name is Lisa Burns. I. I don't think it's on my end. Um, my name is Lisa Burns. I have a student in the system for the, and I've had kids in the system since uh, 2012. Um, I'm concerned about the cost of the track, so I would like to hear if uh, there's any been any planning about a maximum uh, cap on how much would be spent. Also, I'd like to know um, the fund balance um, did get uh, substantially depleted by the uh, track, but you have uh, additional uh, money in there. And if there are any plans um, for that or long-term budgeting plans that take into account the age of our schools, the PCB testing, the alleged upcoming um, uh, net zero work where I we would try and lower our footprint, the windows that um, keep getting pushed back and more expensive. Where does all this fit into a big plan for that pot of money? Thank you. Do you want to start? I, I can start on there. some of the the easier parts of that. So uh, Lisa, if you look on slide 27 of the budget presentation, that's the capital plan and you'll see the, the time period for the window renovation as well as other renovations to our buildings, primarily at Union Elementary School and Main Street Middle School. Um, those are included in the capital plan, those kind of things. Christina, do you have our fund balance numbers up I saw you Google or looking at it. Yeah, I can start to pull that up. Just in this presentation, there's nothing regard in regards to any of that for that for yeah. 24 budget. The track is not inclusive in this budget because it's paid for out of fund balance, so it has no impact whatsoever on our tax rates or Montpelier Roxbury's tax rates um, because it's not being paid in that way. I wrote yeah. down a number from the last meeting. No, my yeah. the fund and balance. Yeah. Oh, because Christina said this last. Yeah, it was too. one million five hundred and ninety-three thousand, 
and that two percent that were required by law to care or by policy, by policy. Um, to carry like a two percent fund balance, which would be five hundred and forty three thousand. Um, and we're allocating, you know, right now as it stands, we have four hundred thousand dollars in this budget allocated from the fund balance. Um, so that would bring it down to one million one hundred and ninety three, which is roughly what four yeah. percent. Which is historically higher, much much higher than the district is generally yeah. carrying. No, my my question is exactly is to that point. So as we were hearing the discussions of the um, Bill Jerome Adventure track um, back in, in September, October, November, um, there was a lot of talk where at points it was up over five million, and and then it was stated that we would discuss those issues and add-ons um, once this had been started and i understand it's definitely started so congratulations but i wonder how much more um the fund balance of the fund balance is going to be spent so uh, uh, to to pay for that trip because everyone admitted that the 1.9 that's been committed so far is not going to be adequate and i've seen no information about the bids contractor bids that have come in um nor what you've added um so that's what i'm trying to get at how much money is our whole our district well i don't i don't think there's any discussion about the 1.9 million million inadequate for mm -hmm. what we allocated it for and that well, is on that with all of I'm our sorry. other needs lisa sorry you're cutting in yeah. and out a little bit the, the connection is yeah. not strong yeah. but I think we understood what you're yeah. what you're saying yeah so the yeah the 1.9 million was allocated for you know a certain project other things were discussed um, no money was allocated for that um, money may or may not be allocated for for additional things depending on you know what we discuss in the future um, you know we did allocate enough for the project that was put before us um, uh, Historically, yeah. there were three pieces to yeah. a project that the board asked for. Yeah. So the board asked for three different <coughs> ways the track project could go and voted on the smallest. Yeah. Uh, and including project. elements that didn't include a track, including elements in a turf, the turf field, which is the you know $5 million that I think was referenced. Um, so those those are future discussions that you know the the board will have to wrestle with later um you know in terms well, of um, if i may just interrupt briefly uh, as i understand you plan to break ground very soon and the contractors are being hired so i would think these decisions need to be made now and to say you'll d tell us about how much it'll cost in the future uh seems a little distant well, they, towards taxpayers and we my understanding is is that the, the project that we allocated for we we can build without without additional funds um so okay. so on that you're you're actually not correct we we do not have to make decisions okay. about additional okay. funds for what we've decided okay. on i think to clarify like libby you were trying to clarify that yes. there was in the presentation from andrew yeah. La Rosa, um, the facilities director, he gave us enough information, the board enough information about like all the variety of things yeah. that we could potentially add to the project, and the board decided not to fund the, all of those other additional yeah. things. They decided just to fund the most basic um, way that the project could move forward, which is basically just doing the track. And yeah. the only extra thing that they added, I think, was like the eight lanes straight away. So that money has already been allocated from the fund balance, which was not yeah. any ta additional tax burden to any taxpayer because it's basically savings that the school board has from um, from school budgets of, of years past that we've saved up and didn't end up spending. So we kind of had to spend some of that and we decided to allocate a certain amount of money towards that project, which is not a, a tax burden. Um, and I think if there was, a, I think what Jim was speaking to is if there was any sort of future ask to revisit some of those uh, other parts of the project, like let's say the snack shack or a press box, that that would be require all the public, you know, open meeting law 
warnings and stuff that w were required the first round. So you would definitely hear about um, those conversations and be able to be part of them. Yeah, and I think also to get to your concern, like we did not create an expenditure that's going to necessitate an additional expenditure. So right. because we built the track, it does not mean that we have to build the turf field. Correct. It does not mean that we have to build the, the building shed. We could choose never to build those. However, the board could also choose to build those. I mean, it could revisit both of those ideas in the future and decide to build those either with fund balance funds or it could decide to fund them in another way. So uh, we've committed to a discrete project that's a, that's a project that does not necessi necessitate us spending further things. So we didn't decide to, you know, build half a building, kind of knowing that if we build half a building, we have right. to build the other half. Right. Um, but, you know, yeah, but that but the board also did not make any promises that it would never do either of those projects in the future too. The board could decide this board or another board, you know, next year, or five years from now, that one of these other ideas is a good idea, um, and and look at it discreetly then. So uh, we have a discrete project that we approved that doesn't commit us to further funds, but you know the the board will, you know, if if there's new ideas and new needs down the road. Um, yeah, we'll consider those, including some of the ideas that came up as part of this brainstorming process. And additionally, if something were to come up that was un an unexpected ex yeah. expense in the when they break ground on that project, we'd have to deal with that. We would have to then publicly warn a conversation yeah. about allocating <clears throat> more funds. Or, yes. you know, if in the investigation of this project we realize that, you know, as we did with like the playground, that there is maybe contaminated soils and it goes from right. the, the, you know, the project we, we budgeted for to a much bigger project, the board could revisit the, you know, that idea and say, you know, either maybe not or maybe we need to fund this differently. Does that clarify, yeah. Lisa? Does yes. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Um, the other part of my question, though, was about the um, the net zero um, and the implications that um, that will come from once we finally um, get that that project going. Um, the cost that it will take to bring these very very old buildings to net zero as well as the potential cost of the PCP study looking at the uh, the Burlington thing with a 165 million dollar bond if any of these things are um, under discussion with our school board about how they might be handling those money issues thank you I'll turn my speaker off so maybe it'll work better uh, Kristen, do you want to give an update on the Net Zero sure. study? Yeah, so for Net Zero, Lisa, uh, the school board earmarked $50,000 or committed $50,000 to uh, Net Zero, and that was in the spring of 2021, I believe. And so at this point, the Energy and Facilities Committee has, is coming together, and we are working on drafting a resolution and or policy around uh, the district's kind of approach uh, to to achieving net zero. Um, and we're really trying to take a good hard look at what the best, most optimal, uh, most optimal use of that $50,000 will be, whether that's in support of development of, of a policy or systems or whether that's, uh, you know, turning that over to uh, facilities to do an engineering study. So we are, we are still in process on that and um, I would expect a draft resolution coming from our committee within the next two to four weeks. Is that helpful? Well, it wasn't really what I was asking, but I, I think that there's just simply no information. You, there are no long-term plans then for the, our old buildings. Um, PCB uh, contamination. Thank you. Lisa, I would also say that our um, our energy and facilities meetings are open um, public meetings, and if you go to um, our committee page, uh, you will find our meeting agendas as well as minutes that you can get up to date information on that in our meetings. Thank you. 
And we did discuss the PCB thing is, is an unknown. It's an unknown. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's a mysterious unknown that we won't know until our schools are tested. Yeah. Right. So there's no really good way right now for us to know exactly how much money we should be thinking about allocating for that. Yeah. So it's one of those things that... It's and, also an unknown from the state perspective as to how much money the state will be allocating right. yes. yeah, once there's testing comes through. Yeah. So it's, you know... Um, there's no good way for us to financially plan for something that can't be known. Um, but, you know, we're in a good position having a 4% fund balance. You know, we're not at a 2% fund balance, which is all that we require. We have a 4%. So at least we have some, some way to, um, you know, some money saved and set aside for emergency purposes. David, is that your hand up again, or is that an old hand? I think Nathan was next, too. And well, Nathan's hand has gone down. Nathan, do you still want to? No, it's still there. The hand it's is still, still there. there. Oh, yeah, it's just blended in your background. OK, Nathan. Um, hello, school board. Thank you very much for the work you do. And especially thank you to Libby and team on the budget, which is a huge deal. Um, I come back to a theme I've asked about a lot in the past, um, both about folks who are on IEPs and 504 plans, so you know students who need a lot of support, but then I'm especially interested in the, in the students who are um, not struggling enough to qualify for an IEP, uh, but still you know maybe underperforming their their uh, grade expectations or um, needing more sufficient emotional support, etc. Um, this is, I guess, to Libby. Do you feel confident now, you know, after you've had a number of years, you've got staff in place and you've got more data, is this, and I know that the budget's not the only answer, but is this, is that, are there enough resources either in hand now or in this next year's budget to be making really aggressive progress for all students on, on performance and support? Yeah, Nathan, I can remember you asking this question, I think my first year of superintendency. So I appreciate your perseverance. Um, yeah, we, we've done considerable work in this area. It's all under the pillar of timely system to intervene and remediate. And, and we've added significant resources in terms of human resources over the past three years. Um, in each budget cycle, the board has seen increases in our intervention staff. And I can remember saying to you at one point, Nathan, that we can't just add people to a lack of system. Um, and so we've worked very hard on the system piece of this, going back to Michael Fullins, think about systemness rather than individuals. Um, and so we've made significant inroads there. Um, and if you can see part of that in, my, in one of the latest blogs with the UES intervention team in particular, um, which are, um, an incredibly high-flying team right now and doing a lot of really good work at UES. So I'd encourage everybody who has similar concerns with Nathan to watch that vlog, um, which you can find on our website. And we are increasing our capacity at Main Street to match the capacity we have at Union. I think there is a need for more capacity at the high school in the future in terms of remediation efforts. Uh, however, we uh, don't have the system or schedule there yet. We haven't figured out some things yet at the high school. Um, so I hesitate to add more human resource at the high school without knowing what they're doing, um, without having the culture and the climate and the system and the schedule in place here at the high school for that work. So I can imagine in the future we will be adding more FTE there. Um, however, we've made significant inroads at UES and NSNS and we have a system in place now that we're seeing large gains for students that we've never had the data to show before and we never had the system to show before um, through our intervention system so um, it's work i'm proud of and it's it's been hard work and long work and a pandemic didn't help <laughs> didn't help in many cases uh, but this year in particular uh, through a lot of work by Mike Berry, quite honestly. He, he's gotten that intervention team across the district working together as a collective group and making some differences for kids who are tangled. Yeah, 
Thank you very much. Uh, you did um, you did mention RVS? Yeah, RVS. We have 0.5 F, or actually, we have 1.0 FTE. Sorry, um, an intervention that's out of our Title One A uh, funds. So we do have 1.0 FTE there, um, and w that that person, that individual, is part of the district wide intervention team. Um, and working closely with the intervention team and building a lot of professional capacity. RBS is also a slightly different beast because of the small amount of kids. They can look at their school as a whole and their five full, Beth's next blog actually that she put in today, it hasn't been published yet, but it's coming out soon. Um, I highly recommend you read that as well, blog posts around the five pillars. She explains beautifully how RVS right now is working on using all of their full-time employees and looking at their data for 34 students and saying who's doing what <laughs> um, and breaking it up that way rather than thinking about one interventionist job. Um, so when that blog post comes out, I believe it's the next blog post that will be published. So when that comes out, take a look at it. because Beth does a beautiful job of, of writing that up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. from, uh, from my perspective as a parent of two children in RBS, their experience is not as a grade or a class participant. It's a, it is as a whole school participant. Like they're, they're going, there's no grade, there aren't really grades in, in a lot of ways. They're, they're, they're interacting with all the kids at all the different levels in multiple different ways. It's a whole, <coughs> it's really a different experience. Um, yeah, and that's by design, by a lot of good, good, um, good thinking and process from Beth um, and to get kids mixed up and seeing lots of different kids and, and having teachers, that collective responsibility, really trying to instill that in the, in the teachers there um, because they can, right? <laughs> um, so it's, it's, Beth's done a good job with that work or she's working towards it, which is great. And it's, it, it builds the community mm -hmm. because it connects families that might not otherwise be connected, mm -hmm. honestly. I, yeah. have, I have a couple of follow-ups from public comment that could, we could use this time to address. Yeah, Maybe totally. the, I think that, well, the one that Angela mentioned about neurodiverse, I think is a little bit of a combo with what Nathan was just saying. Is there, are there things where you could point to in the budget where you say this is, it, this is how we are supporting kids, neurodiverse kids. Is that largely through IEPs? This is partially because I have a big, you know, like I'm very ignorant about it. So it would be helpful. In the budget, because well, the budget's big. Yeah, right? I don't it's know. A, I guess it, yeah, it's a big view. So you would look at the special education pieces. Okay. Social emotional learning pieces. Um, you'd look at facilities pieces. So for instance, yep. our lights have been completely changed over the past three years so that they're, the large majority of our lights, if not all of them, are on dimmings, dimmers. Yep. Okay. Um, they're not the fluorescent bulbs. They're, you know, like we've, we've done a lot of work there. Um, so it's, that, it's tough to break it down to a granular uh -huh. piece. It's also our system of intervention remediation and, and first instruction as right. well, you know. So when we're talking about engagement strategies for first instruction, we're talking about how do you engage all kids yep. in the learning and how do, you, how do you use multiple modalities to make that happen? Um, how do you get kids up out of your seats and, and talking or teach them how to talk? You know, mm. that's the executive functioning skills. So there's, it's granular, right? right? You wouldn't see it necessarily represented in a general school budget because of that. Because it's not like you can just hire one more staff person and, to and say do, you're my staff member yeah. for neurodiversity right. yeah we wouldn't right. do that but for example the intervention team that you had on the vlog do they have training to help with different varieties of neurodiversity when it comes to the interventions that they're doing yeah I think part of the tricky thing is that neurodiversity is a relatively new term to right. education and mm -hmm. I believe people are defining it in different ways okay. So some people are using that term for more social emotional pieces or executive functioning skills. Some people use that term for um, different ways kids learn to read. Some kids, some people are using all of the above yeah. for that term. Um, so I think that's part of the challenge when people use that term. Um, there may be a, a 
you know, academic definition to it, but when um, parents are using that term, for instance, they, they may be using it with multiple definitions. So mm -hmm. I think that's important to note, mm -hmm. um, which is not surprising with new terms, right? So you can yeah. say the same thing probably about social emotional learning, <laughs> you know? So, um, or mental health. Or, or restorative practices. Or restorative practices, exactly. Sure. When okay. we have new, new ideas coming into education, it takes a while to hone in definitively. Yeah. Um, okay, that's helpful, thank you. My second one is to follow up on the letter that I wrote, the numbers in there about, or not that I wrote, that I read from um, the UES food service team. You know, one, two of the numbers that they threw out were inflation went up 9% in 2022. Their, you know, salary increase was 3%. Would it be possible to see what, the, what it would look like if we said, if we said, let's say what their salary goes up another three percent could we see that for the next budget you know what what that budget implication would look like i just just have no idea for food so, service for the food service workers um, in this budget food service is not included um, food service is a self-sustaining okay. completely different fund so the only thing you see out, um, in regards to food service here is your the support transfer. from the general fund to the uh, food service fund. Okay. So we can It's basically talk. its own business. Yeah. yeah. Run yeah. by Jim Birmingham. Right. So, and it runs at a deficit every year. Right. Um, so it, it's a matter of how much you want to increase the deficit. Right. Okay. So I, I mean, I, knew, I understood that I think at an intellectual level. I didn't realize that then salaries for the workers who are in our food service aren't represented in our budget. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's interesting. We're in a whole separate fund. Is the deficit represented in our budget? Yeah, 110,000 is what we transfer from our budget into food service. That's what's in the budget. Well, that's that's what we budget to transfer. Right, um, sorry. When you end the year, you know, based on the reimbursement rates, the federal reimbursement rates and the state reimbursement rates and how much participation you have in the food service program, you don't know your deficit until you get to the end of the year. Um, so then I know a couple years ago, I think Grant had to come back and say, oh, we need an additional 60,000 to cover. Don't quote me on those numbers. <laughs> um, because you anticipate a deficit, um, and that's statewide. I don't want you to think that that's unique to Montpelier. Every food service program that I'm familiar with has always run a deficit, so <laughs> um, right. that's not unique to your district. Was it last year that you put an exception because of COVID, right, that where the deficit wasn't uh, that much? Um, uh, that year, so the year that Right now it's funded federally and state by state funds. Um, that first year, a full year of COVID, we had, there was huge reimbursement rates. Mm -hmm. So we actually ended up with, um, I could call it a surplus, but really it was the balance of what you folks transferred in there. It was like you only needed a, you only needed a couple thousand dollars yeah. to cover the deficit. So you ended up with, um, on the plus side in the food service fund. And we we decided we, to keep it there. Yes, we left it there, so anticipating a deficit this current year because the funding mechanism has changed, has the changed rates it. have changed. And we're not sure how it's gonna look next year. We don't know how it's gonna look. If the state is still gonna be kicking in, because right now everybody gets free mm -hmm. um, breakfast and lunch. So who, who would be like the appropriate decision makers for them to, it doesn't <coughs> feel like it, it's us, <laughs> you know, for them to forward that letter to or for us. I mean, because I am supportive of if I, it, it kind of breaks my heart that they don't feel like they're valued employees, and I would love to make sure that they know that they are valued employees. Um, so, what what is in our purview to like make any change? So, in that? Jim Birmingham runs our food service. Um, he's our director of food services, and the way there's been significant changes, and I was actually. A, slipped my mind I was gonna have you pull these up earlier um, but there's been significant changes across the years in how much food service has been paid mm -hmm. um, and I particularly remember Christina you might know this like two years ago there was a serious bump in food service wages because we didn't have enough staff so Jim was trying to attract staff um, so that we could be fully staffed was it two years ago or that three was years the ago beginning of the first full 
pandemic year. Yeah. I think it was 21, 22. Yeah, fiscal year 22, there was a significant increase. Mm -hmm. um, do I remember that question coming to the board? Or no? No. It no. It, we were informed about it, but it didn't come to the board. You were us. informed of it. Oh, okay. Um, and so we did make that significant bump. It was on, pre with Grant, Christina's predecessor, he did have a plan to increase food service wages across several years. We, we shoved up the timeline on that. Um, and we've also, we also added a food manager or a kitchen manager, I'm not sure exactly what their title is, at Union Elementary School and Main Street Middle School, whereas previously we only had one at the high school. So we added two um, positions that do receive health care benefits at Union and Main Street. Uh, we added the position at RBS as well. Um, and then there's staffing. There, there's staff who do the cooking and things. So the food manager do the ordering and plan menus right. with Jim and all that kind of stuff. So we, the, the board did, I believe, add those two positions three years ago. Yeah, we'd have to go back and look. Um, so there were there has been significant changes to how Jim structures the food service and how it generally works is Jim comes to me to talk it through um, and we make decisions that way. And so it's not statewide, it's district wide and it's a business. He's an employee of the school district. Yes. And then he manages a budget that is state and federal funds. Separate, yeah. It's, it's, it's essentially a separate business. Mm -hmm. And he receives state and federal funding through reimbursement with how many meals kids take every day. And do you have a sense of where we stand, like just like the per pupil question, sort of where we stand with food service workers, their salaries or their hourly wages? Across districts, no. I, I couldn't give you that number. I don't know. Employees in other districts are unionized, so um, I have and, worked and in part of AFSME or their instructional assistant. Yeah, so I've worked at districts where they're union um, and their support considered support staff. So there is that model out there. And I believe at one point in time, our food service was unionized prior to me, mm -hmm. um, but they've never been unionized since I've been superintendent. So that's Separate from the two unions that we now, or part of the IA? I want to say they were part of AFSME at one point, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, I think they, I think that's true. I'm not totally sure, but it's correct. Well, I don't know if we, if it would be like a, but an agenda item for another time, maybe. But it's, I mean, I as an individual board member am supportive of the food service staff, and would like to for you and Jim to start, sort of explore the possibility of increasing their wages or um, or maybe encouraging them to unionize if that's what they want. I think one of the challenges that I have to weigh as well is that um, we have several staffing, right? And so if we pay one group of staff members considerably more than say our instructional assistants, mm -hmm then we could potentially be setting ourselves up for our instructional assistants to leave to a different job when we are in desperate need of instructional assistance. You know, so we yeah. have, I have to look across the board about with multiple employees. Um, it's not quite so cut and dry. Yeah. I would, I would like to echo your comment. I, I don't think it absolves us of having some interest in this. I didn't, I didn't really realize that structure and I'm, concerned because I know how much so many of us rely on our food service employees and they're interacting with our kids every day and feeding our students these like amazing meals and I, I'm also really concerned that they I didn't realize they weren't receiving certain benefits and I didn't realize they were w making well below $18 an hour so for what it's worth I would like to add that concern. It would be good to hear from Jim. I was just thinking, would yeah. the board like a presentation from Jim Birmingham? Yeah, I, I don't know for it. I mean, we've had that in the past. We have. He hasn't come in a while. He hasn't come in a couple of years. Yeah, no. I don't think I've ever seen it, so that would be two years. No. Yeah. 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 No, the last time. Actually, and the Jim's last time. Jim's fantastic. Yeah. No, Jim is fantastic. And the last time I think we really got a, like, food service presentations, the issue was actually more around 
wellness. It was around the nutritional policy. Nutritional policy and mm. wellness. Um, but I think there's been a lot of improvements there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would be, Hello? That would be great. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, I, I've been trying to get in on Zoom while feeding kids and doing homework. This is Nancy Bruce. I am a taxpayer and a food service employee. I would like to correct you, Libby, by saying you did not add positions. You actually gave a very long-term employee benefits after 25 years of service. So um, there was nothing added that wasn't already there. And it's not accurate. Pardon me? That's not accurate. We increased hours and we made a new position in food management and then added staffing to cover that. Like that position wasn't just rolled over to a new one. The FTE remained the same. So tell me, please, where you added staffing to UES. We added a kitchen manager position. So number of FTE when, and increased? Is that what you, you're saying? So there was an additional person? the staffing increase to increase the food manager position. And it sounds like somebody who was currently on staff went into Took that, that role. position, yes. And then did you hire someone to fill I'd have to that? ask Jim that. Okay. I'm not okay. sure about his staffing. Okay. That's pretty, I don't have yeah. anything Nancy, to do with the Nancy hiring. Nancy Webb has been running that kitchen for 25 years. She finally got benefits last year, the year before. Um, so we are, very understaffed we haven't had any addition to staff so I would welcome an opportunity to meet with you for Jim to come in um, because I, that information as I understand it and experience it is not correct we are really understaffed and um, running food service under a business model within a nonprofit or organization you know that that doesn't make sense. We don't we don't earn a livable wage. We are many dollars an hour, three dollars over three dollars an hour short of the state of Vermont average pay for what we do. And so, you know, there's got to be more that you folks can do. I hope. To honor and respect the hard work that we that we do every day to feed hundreds of children. Well, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I think the board I'm definitely hearing an interest in learning more and, and figuring mm -hmm. out what the situation is and what we can do. It sounds like hearing from Jim about the structure and, and getting some some numbers and historical information is, is a first step. But um, <coughs> yeah, we we do want to reiterate that. Uh, food service is you know, critical and critically valued, um, critical to our kids and critically valued, and, and we really appreciate what you do. So we do uh, do appreciate you bringing us to our attention and do, do want to learn more, and I think getting Jim on a near-term agenda mm -hmm. to talk about food service so we can understand these issues better and, and see what we can do is, is important. Right, well, Jim told us really specifically that you know he's not going to negotiate a wage for us, that we have to go through Libby. I love Jim. He's a great boss. So whatever you know, whatever you folks have to do to just do what's right. No, no thank you. We we want to make sure that you are adequately paid and adequately um, compensated, and um, that you come in feeling that you are valued and, and rewarded as you should. I look forward to your response as a board. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. These can be uncomfortable conversations, but it's also like the board doesn't know what we don't know, and it's yeah. you know it's good to to start um, start the conversation. So yeah. thank you. Excellent. Um, anything more on the budget? Otherwise, we can go to policy monitoring. And thank you, everyone, for showing up and asking great questions. Um, 
Uh, policy monitoring, you have two policy monitoring reports to approve, uh, D07 and F19. D07 is volunteers and work study students, and F19 is uh, limited English proficiency students. Uh, do I have a motion to, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you. I uh, do have a motion to approve those two policy monitor reports. I move to approve the policy monitoring report for D7 and F19. Do I have a second? Oh, second. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, so we have a third reading of the of the policies replacing repealing current po policies replacing repealing current policies AO2, AO3, AO4. Um, I'll let Emma speak more. The policy committee met a couple days ago. Uh, I think the two things. One, a couple of these I think are pretty close. A couple of these I think the policy committee would like a little more time on. Um, so I think it probably makes sense to have a, a fourth reading. Uh, I also just want to make sure it looks like all of the PDFs that Anna sent around had the changes. I also sent them around in Word just to make sure. Um, uh, but kind of given what was there and the idea, I, I think we have a fourth reading of these. Um, any questions or comments for the policy committee or anything Emma you want to add yeah I'll just add that so on December to our December 12th meeting we made the changes from the first read but then and we had some technical difficulties yeah, they because they my translate. computer died and yeah. Jim had to switch to taking notes and then um, and then you there was a second read on December 21st and our only meeting since then was um, this past Tuesday and we, that meeting was sort of taken up with um, the library, the librarians from the district uh, proposing a draft of library material selection policy. And then our student reps, um, Merrick and Zach, are working on the curriculum language for the DEI policy. So I didn't realize we were gonna run out of time. <laughs> and so we just ran out of time during that meeting and didn't have time to incorporate the new changes. So we've scheduled a meeting for um, the 10th, I believe, which is next Tuesday, right? Yeah, Tuesday the 10th. Um, it's from 1230 to 1. So I have your notes, you know, on the documents, and thank you for those. But if anybody is free and can come or wants to email us with additional feedback on, on those policies, then we can make those changes. And then I think um, we definitely are going to need a 4 3. So I don't think it makes sense really to go through them tonight because there's no substantive. Substantive? Substantial. Substantive or substantial. <laughs> I, I blended the two. Yes. Um, uh, changes from, from the 21st. So. And, I, and I also think it, it makes sense to have these all at the same timing because they're rebuilding right. in place qualities. So if we yeah. enact a few and don't enact them all, then I think it might be confusing as to. Yeah. Like what's two there of them are ready, not. the other three aren't. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Um, so that's next Tuesday at 1. Tuesday at 12 12 30 to 1 we're trying to okay yeah. we're trying to be quick about it mm -hmm. yes <laughs> um, so yeah either you can try to you can come to that meeting or you can email me with the changes would you give me the numbers again of those pol the policies that you're going to review it's with it's a 20 through 24 which are those are the new policies that we're appealing like our current I think AO1 through AO3 um, they're on the agenda too. They're I did read them all, but I just don't have them open right now. Okay, yeah. There, you can. You'll be able to reference them on the agenda. They're all linked on the agenda, and the three that are going to be repealed are also listed on the agenda. Um, so now I think we executive session to just give an update on contract negotiations uh, for both MRSA and uh, teachers. Um, so I think I think Anna helpfully put the motion language in the agenda. So if someone wants to, we need two motions. We need. Um, 
motion. Oh, wait a second. Did, did, you, the did, motion. You, put the, did you put the magic language in the last mm -hmm. you did? Yeah, I saw it in there. It is? It's on the agenda. It's in there. Motion to consider exchange for the purpose of discussion. No, but we have to make a finding about yeah. the um, district being placed at substantial disadvantage. disadvantage. You are channeling your inner Bridget AC so yes. beautifully. Yes, so first we need <laughs> a motion that it puts it the district at substantial disadvantage. disadvantage to discuss contract negotiations in public or some such language. But I think that's close enough for. Henry Yeah, Anna, can you want to? No, I don't know that. <laughs> Say something close. <laughs> <laughs> I move to f that the board finds uh, uh, the board that, hold on, help me out here. Yes. Uh, so uh, I the, the board um, would be uh, that placed I find at a substantial. The board would be placed at a substantial disadvantage um, if contract negotiations were discussed in open session. Second. Any okay, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Now we just need a motion. Now we need now I, the motion. I should move that we enter the executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations with MIVA and MIVA as a second. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, let's go into. And how do we bring Lynn with us? Huh?